Father, we thank you for this session again with your beloved people. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. Thank you for the sustaining power to keep on serving you. And your people keep on serving and they're not tired. They're not weary. Lord, I pray you strengthen your people the more in Jesus' name. You committed a great work into our hands. And I pray that nobody will leave his post of duty. Whatever wind may blow, your people will stand. Whatever thing may happen, Lord, I pray your people will not be drowned in the sea of problem in Jesus' name. Every time they call upon you, you will answer. And as they are serving you, Lord, I pray heaven will always respond positively to their cry in Jesus' name. Bless them and bless their families. Bless their children. Wife, husband, bless them. Any challenge, anything anybody is passing through privately that we may not know, Lord, I pray, rebuke the enemy on their behalf in Jesus' name. And I pray you put joy in every heart. Solve the problems of your people. We will glorify you. Put testimony in every mouth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. I am blessed. Say it for yourself. It will remain. We're coming to Second Corinthians chapter five, and I'm reading from verse seventeen. Second Corinthians chapter five. We're reading from verse seventeen. Here he tells us. It says, therefore. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Tonight we are looking at the word of God on the stage, understanding of new men in Christ. We need to understand that all men without Christ have something missing that makes them unfit for heaven. Anyone on the face of the earth that doesn't have Christ, he may be nice and kind, yet there's still something missing. He may be wise and successful, yet there's still something missing. He may be gentle and kind, yet something is missing. He may be wild or worldly, He'll still find something is missing in his life. He may be respectable or reprobate. Something is still missing. He may be sincere or he may be sensual. Something is missing. That person may be cultured and refined. And people look at him, a well-built man, a cultured man, a refined man. Yet, if he doesn't have Christ, if he's not a man in Christ, a woman in Christ, he has so much of the first Adam in him. So much of the first Adam and Eve in him, in her. They are fit for the world. Why are they fit for the world? Because they're nice and they're gentle. Because they're generous and they're good. Because they're successful and they're business enterprising. Because they are kind of worldly and the people of the world, the people of the world will listen to them. Because they're sincere and they may be honest and they're respectable. They are feed for the world, but because something is still missing in them, they are feed for heaven. Only new men in Christ can be in the new earth and the new heaven which the Lord has prepared for his own. The Lord said it in a single sentence, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the flesh, that's the natural man. That which is born of the flesh, it might be religious, religious flesh, it's still flesh. It might be philanthropic, it's still flesh. 
he might be educated but is born of the flesh is flesh he might be well behaved and people look at him and they say it's a well behaved man it's a well behaved woman all the same the flesh is flesh he may be church registered because the church a denomination has registered him as a nice person a good person a member of their church but flesh is still flesh he may be baptized in water either baptized as infant or baptized as an adult baptized flesh is still flesh he may be church confirmed it's gone through some blessings, it's gone through some rites and ceremonies in that denomination, therefore it's uh, confirmed in that church, all the same, it's still flesh. He may be humanitarian, and he has all this uh, good work, and this good work, and that good work, and everybody refers to him, he's uh, humanitarian, he's charitable. But flesh is still flesh, and flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Christ must make you a new man, a new woman, before you can be fit for heaven. Come back to that second Corinthians chapter five again, verse seventeen. Therefore, therefore, as we look at flesh, therefore, as we look at humanity. Therefore, as we look at everybody, the nice and the good and the gentle and the respectable, therefore, if any man, as this individual comes out of humanity, as this woman comes out of the world, if any man, any woman be in Christ, that's the secret, that's the entry point of being fit for heaven. If he be in Christ, it says, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. The old things that were carried from Adam until the time of the law, until the time of the old covenant, and the things were carried to ourselves until this time. Old things have passed away. And then it says, All things have become new. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter. 10. And we're reading from verse 16. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Circumcise therefore the false king of your heart, and be no more stiff neck. You'll understand when a child is born, he carries something into the world that needs to be cut off from his body. And that is circumcision of the flesh. The Lord is telling us that just like in the physical, also in the spiritual, in the heart of man, he carries something into the world. He was born with that physically. He was born with that spiritually. And now, before he can live in the sight of the Lord, and before he can be regarded as a person in the kingdom, he says, circumcise, cut it off. Therefore, the foreskin, not of the flesh, but of the heart. And he says, be no more stiff neck. Actually, that is saying, present yourself for that circumcision. We're looking at chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, and I'm reading from verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Already has told us there is the first king of the heart. And you brought it with yourself into the world. You got it from Adam. You got it from Eve. And from that time, humanity has been carrying that first skin of the heart. You understand circumcision? The boy cannot circumcise himself. The man cannot circumcise himself. There is no one that can do that for himself. It has to be done for you. For the physical circumcision, for the natural circumcision, a man that is experienced and trained to do that, does that. But now for the spiritual, it says, the Lord thy God. Already before a person is circumcised, 
in the human sense, in the natural sense, he must be born into the world. You can't circumcise the child before birth. The birth has to come first. And so we must be born into the kingdom, we must be born again, we must be saved, we must be converted before the circumcision of the heart can take place. Step one, the child is born. Step two, the child is circumcised. Step one, the person is born again. Step two, the person is sanctified. The person is circumcised. And it says, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. That means circumcision of heart did not stop with the time of Moses. And the heart of thy seed, the new generation that is born into the world, and then they come to know God, their seed must still be circumcised in the heart and then the next generation and the next generation until this generation and the generation that will still follow god will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed for one reason to love the lord thy god with all thine heart as long as the foreskin is still on the heart covering the heart you cannot love him with all your heart you can love him moderately Love him partially, love him in a limited way after you are born again. But when you are circumcised by the circumcision of the Lord, you love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. That's talking about living the life of heaven here on earth. We're coming to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 23, Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 23. It says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, it's talking about something internal. It's talking about something inward. And it says there needs to be a renewal. If any man be, Christ a new creature. A new creature has gone through that process of renewal. And then it says in verse 24, And that she put on the new man, which after God is created. It's a new creation. It's not something you can manufacture by yourself. It's not something you can copy from another person. It's not something you can uh, get into by personal effort or training. And it says here that it's created after God in righteousness and true heavenly holiness recognized by God. We're coming to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and we we'll read from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, we're we'll reading from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, it's talking about something internal. The human nature, the Adamic nature, the depraved nature had died and was buried. And now you rise up into newness of life. And it says, if that has taken place, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. It's saying that your love, inner love, your intimacy, inner intimacy, is talking about the affection, the leanings of your life. It's like you point it now upward to heaven. When you are ordinary flesh, you are attached to the flesh, attached to the world. There's a kind of magnet in you that is drawn to the magnet of the world. There is the force of gravity here in the world that always attracting you, always making you to look at things of the world, love the things of the world, cherish the things of the world, go after the things of the world because the magnet is inside you and the magnet is at the center of the world and it's pulling you down. But now that has been changed. An inner thing had happened. And because of that inner thing, it says now you are risen with Christ. And you are seeking those things which are above, which is not on the earth here. Because Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, 
not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. The old man is dead. The damnic nature is dead. That depravity is dead. The thing you brought into the world with you is dead. And your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I pray it will happen. Mortify therefore. The word mortify means put to death. Kill it. Destroy it. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, God forbid. Uncleanness, God forbid. Inordinate affection, irregular affection, affection for things that are sensual, God forbid in your life. Evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in the which we also watch sometime when we lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, no more anger, wrath, no more wrath, malice, no more malice, blasphemy, no more blasphemy. Filthy communication, no filthy communication out of your mouth again. Lie not one to another forever, forever. Lying is banished. I said lying is banished. Seeing that she have put up the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. The new man. I said the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The stage and the standing of new men in Christ. We're going to look at three simple points. Number one, the inability of the natural man. The natural man. Number two, the identity of the new man. The identity of the new man. Number three, the integrity of newly made men. The integrity of newly made men. Number one, the inability of the natural man. We're coming to First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. Verse 14, the natural man, the natural man. Chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. He's talking about the natural man here, and he says that natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Look up here for a moment. It's like, uh, you know, somebody is speaking a language and you're still in your natural home language. You're still in your natural self. And the man, he's excited, he's speaking Chinese. And he speaks and speaks and speaks. He laughs, he smiles and everything, you know. All he's doing is foolishness to you. Everything is seen, it might be talking of something deep and something high and something broad and something great and something that is beneficial. But for you, it's foolish because you do not understand. You are hearing sound, you are hearing words, you don't understand because you are not Chinese. But if you are converted, if you are transformed, if your heart, your nature, your tongue, your ears, if everything is transformed into Chinese, then when he speaks now, everything will be clear because of that transformation. But the natural man has an inborn deformity which cannot be corrected or rectified by any earthly means. A person who is natural, born into this world, no matter where he goes for education, no matter where he lives, he has an inborn deformity which cannot be rectified or corrected by earthly means because he has an inherent stain, an inherited stain that stains every good work he tries to do. A person who is natural has an inbred stain, inbred sin has an inherited stain, inherited sin that blots all the pages it tries to write the activities of life on. God sees all the blots, 
which are not always visible to the natural eyes. Because his flesh, the natural man, number one, cannot please God. God is supernatural. He is natural. That natural man can never please the supernatural God. He is earthly. And God is heavenly. That natural man, earthly, cannot please the heavenly God. He is sinful. And God is holy, perfectly holy. That natural man, not touched, not transformed, not renewed, not converted, not born again, not washed by the blood of the Lamb. He cannot please the holy God. Number two, he cannot fulfill God's demand. The natural man, no matter how he tries, he cannot fulfill God's demand. God's demand is so high. God's demand is so holy. And God's demand is so heavenly that that natural man, no matter how he tries by himself, by personal self-effort, he cannot fulfill God's demand. Number three, he cannot do God's will fully in God's own way. He doesn't have the resources to do that. He doesn't have grace. He doesn't have a new life. He doesn't have supernatural power. He doesn't have what it takes to do God's will fully in God's way. Number four, he cannot walk without stumbling in God's way. God has made the way. But the man is impotent. The man is unable. And because of that natural inability, he cannot walk. He'll be wobbling. He'll be stumbling in God's way. Number five, he cannot obey God perfectly as God expects. God expects obedience. And this man natural, he doesn't have anything. An empty bag cannot stand upright. That empty bag, you can wash it naturally and put it down, it will collapse. An empty bag, you can paint it another color and put it, it will collapse. At that empty bag, you can write a good name on it and say, you call it by good name, put it down, it will collapse. An empty bag cannot stand upright. This man, a natural man, is empty of grace. Is empty of the righteousness of God, is empty of the virtue of heaven, is empty of everything you can think about that came from heaven, an empty bag that cannot stand upright, the natural man that has not been converted by God cannot stand upright. Number six, he cannot meet God's high standard. God's standard is high. God's standard is high. And that natural man, he might come to church. He might memorize the scriptures. He might do everything you think a religious man should do. But he cannot meet God's standard. And he cannot, number seven, he cannot improve the flesh for heaven. He cannot improve on the flesh for heaven. The flesh will still be flesh. Educate it. The flesh will still be flesh. Reform it. The flesh will still be flesh. And try to make it religious. The flesh will still be flesh. We're told, look at that again. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually distant. Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 6. Romans chapter 8. We're reading from verse 6. It tells us here. It says, For to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind, so everything is of the mind. Uh, whatever the hand does, the hand is not free, it's connected to the heart. Wherever the feet go, the feet are not free, they're connected to the heart. Wherever the eyes see, the eyes are not free, they're connected to the heart. Whatever you do, whatever you say, wherever you go, everything is dictated and prompted and stirred up and directed by the heart. And if the heart, if the mind is carnal, if the heart, if the mind is earthly, 
If the heart, if the mind is a dummy, if the heart and the mind is still coming with the old nature, what can you do? You will act according to the old nature. That's the reason why you have to come to Christ. You have to get to Christ and then he has to work on you. And it is when that work of grace is done, that's when there will be a mighty change. It says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It is not subject to the law of God. He can hear it. He can study it. He can learn it. He can appreciate it. He can try to do it, but he cannot. He cannot. He doesn't have what it takes on the inside to do that. That's why it says, so then in verse 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. Cannot please God. It is not that they don't want to, even if they wanted to, they couldn't do it because you need the wherewithal, you need the strength, you need the power, you need the supernatural, you need the very nature of God to be able to do that. And look at chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold, understand. He says, now I see the root of my problem. He says, I see the reason why I tried, but I failed. I see the reason why, because the old man cannot fulfill the law of the new covenant. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. I tell myself, I'll never do that again. I make resolution, I'll never do that again. Natural man, there's no way you'll be able to fulfill that kind of resolution. It says, For what I would, that I do not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that the law is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but tell me sin that dwelleth in me. It says the engine that propels the wheel or propels the propeller. The engine is inside. If that engine is working, the direction in which it works is what will appear outside. You cannot blame the tires for rolling. It's the engine within. You cannot blame the fan that is moving. It is something inside. He said, there's an engine inside me. He says, there's sin inside him. And because of the sin inside him, all the outward actions will come. And therefore, if you don't do something about the inside, all those outward actions, you cannot change them. He says in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, do well let no good thing. Thing, for to will, to decide, to purpose, to plan, to determine is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. Then he says in verse 20, now if I do that I would not. It is no more I that do it, but tell me, sin that dwelleth in me. Sin has taken its seat on the inside and it's relaxed. It's in charge. It's in control. And it's dictating every word and every action and every movement and every plan. It says, what can I do now? I'm a helpless slave of sin. Sin that dwelleth in me. But when you come to the Lord, something will change. I said something it will change. That's the reason why, as we're preaching to people, we're not just telling them, come to church, come to church is good. We're not just telling them, change your dressing, changing the dressing is good. We're not just telling them, don't wear jewelry, not wearing jewelry is good. We're not just telling them, put on your scarf. Putting off your scarf is very good. Why well, don't you just tell me not to wear high heel shoes? Not wearing high heel shoes, maybe that is good. And we're not telling them buy a big Bible. Buying a big Bible is good. But if the inside is not changed, if the inside is not touched, if the inside is not transformed, 
the natural man will remain a natural man. And the natural man can sit on deeper life pew, deeper life chair, deeper life seat in a deeper life church, and he may attend every service if he does not pray, if he does not take that old self, that old nature, take it to Calvary and take it to Christ, that one that is sitting on deeper life seat every Sunday, every Monday, every Thursday, he will remain like that for years there will be no change. It is a sin that dwelleth within and God has to do something about that. God will do it. I said God will do it. Because you see, if the person remains uncircumcised, you still do what circumcised people do. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 6, and I'm reading here from verse 10. It says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and cannot hurt him. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach, and they have no delight in it. The natural man, he does not understand. He hears the word of God, the word of righteousness, and the word of truth, and the word of holiness. Everything is like, why are they saying that? Everything is like, why is that bad? Everything is like... How can I do that? It's a reproach unto them. It says, their ears uncircumcised, and their mind uncircumcised, and their heart uncircumcised. Look at chapter 9 of Jeremiah, verse 26. Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 26. Egypt, and Judah, and Edom, and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the uttermost corners that dwell in the wilderness for all these nations are, tell me, uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are, tell me, uncircumcised in the heart. They had circumcision of the flesh the thought that has finalized it. Some people have baptism in their denomination. They think that has finalized it. Some people have confirmation in their church. They think that has done it. Some people pay tithes and offering. They think that has finalized it. Some people wear the church uniform. And therefore they think that has finalized it like these people. But their hearts are uncircumcised. And therefore as you look at them, look at Israel, look at Egypt, look at Edom, look at Ammon, look at Ammon. They behave all the same. Different nations, yet they behave the same. Different denominations, different church titles, different church affiliation, yet they remain the same because all of them, their hearts are uncircumcised. Look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14, reading from verse 7. In verse 7 it tells us, it says, For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separated himself from me, and set it up his idol in his heart, and put the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and come to the prophet, uh, to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. You see something there? They have idols in their heart. Idols, things of the world, things of earth, things that are sensual, things that are sinful, things that are profitable. They have buried in their heart. Look at verse 9. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a sin. I, the Lord, have deceived the prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my 
people. You know why? Because of your circumcision in their hearts. We're coming to Acts chapter Acts chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 51. Acts chapter 7. Reading from verse 51. It says, Ye steep necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. It says, Their ears are uncircumcised. These were people that were defending Moses. They were uncircumcised. These were people defending the law of God. They were uncircumcised. These were people that were zealous and they could burn and kill another person for religion. Very fanatical and very much religious. And yet it says, Ye uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. What do you mean, uh, Stephen? As your fathers did, so do ye. The state of your fathers, your fathers just didn't understand. They thought that the physical circumcision was all right. They thought the physical circumcision was all they needed. And yet, they needed the circumcision of the heart and the circumcision of the ears. Since he is referring us to, as your fathers did, so do ye. You are circumcised in ears, you are circumcised in heart. Let's look at what he's talking about. Ezekiel, back to Ezekiel again. Ezekiel chapter 44. In Ezekiel chapter 44, I'm reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, In that ye are brought into my sanctuary, strangers, uncircumcised in heart, and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when ye offer my bread, the fat, and the blood. And they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And then it goes on to say, And ye have not kept the charge of my holy things, but ye have said, Keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. And then it goes on to say in verse 9, Thus says the Lord God, No stranger, uncircumcised in heart, no uncircumcised in the flesh, shall enter into my sanctuary or of any stranger that is among you of the children of Israel. That's what Stephen said. He said, your fathers were uncircumcised, uncircumcised in ear, uncircumcised in heart, and so you are doing uh, the same thing. What's the result? When somebody is uncircumcised like that, in the heart, in the mind, in the ear, in the thoughts, internally. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 17. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that she henceforth walk not, as other gentles walk in the vanity of their mind. The uncircumcised mind has a lot of vain things, vanity, a lot of foolish things, foolishness. It goes on to say, having the understanding darkened, being annihilated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. The uncircumcised heart is blind. Blind to the truth of God, blind to the standard of God, and blind to the requirement demand of God, blind to what will take him or her to heaven, blindness of mind, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all on cleanness with greediness. It's like they're eager to do evil. They're greedy to do evil. They're anxious to do evil and they do evil with all their zeal and all their mind. 
because they are circumcised. And in that stage, they are not fit for heaven. The Lord needs to work on us. He needs to work in our heart, work in our mind, work in our thoughts, work in our spirit, and work within us. And then that total change, that total transformation will make us new, prepare us for heaven. Thank God you'll be ready for heaven. Amen. Point number two, the identity of the new man. The identity of the new man. You understand already now from all the scriptures who have read, neither religion nor self-reformation can change the old nature into the new nature. That power is not in your hands. That grace is not there. The way without the means, that's not there. That is the work, that is the work of God through Christ's redemptive sacrifice. Step by step, God brings us back by grace to godliness and to glory. Salvation first, then sanctification. The birth first, then circumcision. We cannot be circumcised before we are born. We cannot be sanctified before we are saved. You must be saved first, born first, before you are sanctified, before you are circumcised. Both are the works of God. You cannot give birth to yourself. You cannot save yourself. You cannot say, why you are not born, I'm going to give birth to myself. You cannot do that. The same thing, you cannot get yourself born again by yourself. A higher power, God Almighty himself, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has to do that and then you are born again. On the same side, in the same way, you cannot circumcise yourself. Another hand has to do that, has to circumcise you. That means you cannot fully, totally, thoroughly, entirely, perfectly sanctify yourself. No matter how much you try, all you can do is to change your outward action. You cannot sanctify your heart. All you can do is to change and try and monitor your language so that what comes out will be a little bit polished. But you cannot sanctify yourself on the inside. God has to do that. He will do it. Both the birth and the circumcision are instantaneous, not gradual processes. Somebody is to be born, is born instantaneously. It's not that I am being born over a period of one month, being born over a period of three months, being born over a period of one year. The child is still being born. The same thing in the spiritual. You are born again instantaneously. You cannot say, I'm being born again over a period of one year. You are born again, born again instantaneously. Circumcision is an instantaneous act. If you are going to circumcise a child in the physical, you cannot say, we've been on it now for one week. We've been on it now for one month. We've been on it in the process of circumcising this child for one year. Circumcision is instantaneous. The same thing, circumcision of heart. When God does it, the Lord thy God will circumcise the heart it is instantaneous sanctification is instantaneous it's an instantaneous work of grace jesus saves he does that instantaneously jesus sanctifies he does that instantaneously and when he does that you are new within you are new without the heart is new the mind is new the thoughts are new the life is new, the character is new, the behavior is new, new on the inside and new on the outside. In 2 Corinthians again, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. How many things become new? Verse 21. For he has made him, referring to Christ, to be seen for us. What that means, he has made him to be the seen offering. He has made him to be our substitute. He has made him to be the sacrifice. He has made him to be our savior. For he has made him to be the sin offering for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We come into him and then we just don't become superficially righteous. We become the righteousness of God in him. That's the identity of the new man. In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. It's talking about identification now. And this one is not just a word. This is experience. This is reality. This is what God has done. And this is what is visible. And this is what is known, experienced on the inside and also on the outside. I am crucified with Christ. He's talking about the old nature when he says, I am crucified. You see, when somebody is crucified on the cross, physically, he cannot there uh, be fighting. He cannot there, because he's crucified, be kicking. He cannot there be rebelling. He cannot, you know, as he's hanging on the cross there, he cannot be perpetrating the same evil he was doing before he came to be crucified on the cross. And he's saying, my old nature is now paralyzed. My old nature is now refined and confined to the cross. It says my old nature is crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's talking about two things there. The old me is crucified. And there's a new me that is coming up. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. And it says the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a really new life. I said that's a really new life. That's what God said he will do. He was looking at Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're looking at verse 6. When God says he will do something, if you don't allow him to do it, you'll still be carrying your own self. If God says I will heal you, if you don't go to God for a very definite work of healing, if you don't go to God for a very definite operation and manifestation of healing, you'll still be carrying the old sickness. If God says, I will bless you. If you don't go to God and say, this is my situation. I need this blessing of God. If God says, I will prosper you. And then you are still satisfied with your poverty. And you say, well, I'm not the poorest person in town. I can tolerate this. I can manage this. The blessing will not be there. If God says, I will sanctify you. It is something that is so definite. And it says, come, come, come. I'm going to do this for you. And it says, and the Lord Lord thy God, you must be safe first. The Lord thy God, He must be your God. He must be your redeemer. He must be, He has touched you already and He has brought you into the kingdom. And He says, You are mine. But after that, after that salvation, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. God will be number one automatically. God will have the first place automatically. The work of God will be number one. Naturally, naturally. It will not be a struggle. It will not be that I'm trying. It will not be that somebody is pushing you. It will not be that somebody is trying to encourage you. When you are sanctified, when you are circumcised, you will love God, love his work, and love his word, and love everything belonging to God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. What that means is that you now really live. There were people who were living in Egypt. That's not living. 
picked up people who are living in the wilderness. So, you know, but in the wilderness, always complaining, always murmuring, always criticizing, always saying, what about this manner? How about this? That, that's not living. But now this living the life of heaven on earth. This living the life of angels here on earth. That you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. There's no complaint. And there's no regret, and there's no murmuring. You live, you live, living the life of heaven here on earth. It will happen. I said it will happen. When you go to God, you might be on your knees and you lay everything on the altar. You open your heart, you open your life unto God and say, Lord, circumcise this that you see. If you're going to circumcise a child, you know, physically, they hold that child so that the child will be steady. And the child might struggle before the circumcision. But once the child knows that, well, what can I do? Look at this hefty man, look at this strong man, look at this person that holding me and they want to do something then the child will surrender and then uh, the circumcision will be done when you're no more struggling with God you come to the altar of God and you lay yourself on the altar and then you open your heart to say that Adamic nature that inbred nature must be taken away is going to be done I said it is going to be done. Look at Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, and I'm reading here from verse 21. Verse 21, it says that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them. Tell me what ends that verse. You do it in unison, one, two, three, go. That's good. Do that again. That's good. You can do better. Final now. Final. As the days of heaven on earth. You, you remember the prayer of Jesus Christ. Thy will be done on earth as, as it is done in heaven. Who are, the, who are doing the will of God in heaven? The angels. No complaint. No comparison. No tiredness, no weariness, no murmuring, nothing. And the days of heaven here on earth, when you are circumcised, you love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and just flowing on in the grace of God. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 4 and in verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, we're reading here from verse 4. In Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4, it says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise yourself to the Lord. You break your covenant with the world. Break your covenant with the earth. Break your covenant with the wilderness. And break your covenant with those things on the earth. And now circumcise, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And take away the first king of your heart. The first king of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Let my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench each because of the evil of your doings. We come now to the New Testament. We're looking at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 2 verse 29. For he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Those Jews need to understand that they thought, you know, the little cap they put on the head, they, saw, they thought that identifies me as a Jew. So that's outward. That's outward. Some people feel the big cross they put on their neck. They think that identifies them. They say, no, that's outward. Some people feel the cross of the earrings that they put and the sign, the sign of the cross. They think that is the uh, that is the sign. Identification. Some people feel that they tattoo. They make on the hand that shows the cross. They feel that that is the solution. It says no, it's a Jew, which is one inwardly. The thought, the mind, the heart, the spirit, the soul. And then he goes on to say, and circumcision is that of the heart. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but is of God. God will do it. I say God will do it. Look at uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 3. Reading from verse 3. It says, For we are the circumcision. 
We are the circumcision. If our hearts are circumcised, if our spirit is circumcised, if our ears are circumcised, if our eyes are circumcised, if everything eternal is circumcised, it says we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Have no confidence in the flesh. All the flesh is crucified, all the flesh is gone. It tells us in Colossians chapter. 2 Colossians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 11 it says in whom also he has circumcised will be circumcision made without hands without the hands of man the one that is not with the hands of man that's physical that's natural that's what a surgeon does for that child that has been born because of the rite and the ceremony of the Jews. But now it says this one is done without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. You see that? The circumcision in putting off the root of the sins of the flesh, in putting off the nucleus, the nucleus of the sins of the flesh, in putting off the embodiment of the sins of the flesh, in putting off the origin of the sins of the flesh, is the root, is the nucleus, is the source. It's the very foundation of the sins of the flesh. And it says the circumcision we're talking about that God is doing is that he puts off the body, the nucleus, the root, the origin, the inbred nature of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. By the circumcision of Christ. And when that happens, you know what God does? He uproots the sin. And then he now implants something new. We're looking at Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one, and I'm reading from verse three. Second Peter chapter one, verse three. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of what kind of nature? Divine nature. Divine nature. Look up here. You came into this world with the human nature. Adamic nature, the nature of Adam. What's the nature of Adam? Have you noticed the nature of Adam? Excuse making. Adam, where are you? I heard your voice in the garden and I hid myself. Have you eaten of that fruit that I told you not to eat? Yes or no? The woman you gave me, she was the one that gave me the fruit. And I did eat. Excuse making. Eve, why did you do that? God, I was just by myself. And the serpent came and beguiled me. And I did eat. The nature of Adam, the nature of Eve, is to make excuse. Is to explain. Yes, I did it. But, yes, I went there. But, yes, I didn't do right. But there's a reason for that. Yes, I made a mess of that, but this is the reason why it's so and so, it's so and so, it's the nature of Adam. And now we come to Christ, and we come the second time, and he approaches that Adamic nature, and he puts the divine nature, the nature of God is beautiful. I said it's beautiful. You'll have it. I said you'll have it. This is something we need to run after. This is something we need to pursue. This is something we need to have. This is something we need to tell God, I must have your nature. If anybody is going to be in heaven, where God is, he must have the nature of heaven. Adam's nature will not get back to heaven. It will not be allowed. You see that old Adam will not be allowed to go back to the garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, they are not even included. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 1 to verse 4. 
Abel. And then verse 5, we have Enoch. Verse 8, we have Abraham. In verse 11, 12 and all that, we have Sarah. And then we come to Abraham. And then we come to Isaac. And then we come to Jacob. And then we come to all of them. What shall I more say? The time will fail me to talk of Gideon and to talk of Barak and to talk of Samson and to talk of those people. In weakness, they were made strong. Check up, the name of Adam is not there. Check up, the name of Eve is not there. If their names cannot even be in Hebrews chapter 11, how about going to heaven? That if you are going to get to heaven, that Adamic nature will not follow you there. Will drag you down, will drag you back. And that evil nature, the natural nature will pull you back. But when you say, God circumcise me, circumcise my heart, circumcise my spirit, circumcise my ear, you will do it tonight. Because Adam and Eve will not follow you there. The old excuse-making nature of Adam and the old unsteady nature of Eve will not be given any chance to enter paradise. It is necessary to be born again, born anew, born from above. It is necessary to be circumcised, necessary to be sanctified by God himself. We cannot carry the nature of Satan, Lucifer, back to heaven. You know Lucifer, he was in heaven. And then there was a nature that came inside him. There was an idea that came inside him. And they drove him away from heaven. And Lucifer became Satan. You know the nature of Lucifer, the nature of Satan. Number one, pride. That thing will not get to heaven again. Number two, self-will. That thing will not get to heaven again. Number three, usurping God's authority. It says, I will raise up my throne. I will ascend on high. I will do this. I will do that. That self-will of Satan will not be allowed again. Perverting God's word went to Eve and said, as God said, you will not eat of this, not eat of that. And Eve said, no, we may eat of everything except this. So oh, God knows that if you eat, your eyes will be open. Misusing God's word, misinterpreting God's word, perverting God's word, that nature will not get to heaven again, striving against God. And he saw the angels. He began to fight. And he drew away one third of the angels after him. That fighting spirit, that thing that will draw away people and draw away the glory of God unto yourself, that thing is not going to be allowed in heaven again. You see his wisdom against God and lying concerning the word of God, that nature will not be allowed in heaven again. We must be circumcised and sanctified through and through. The nature of Adam will be taken away. The nature of Eve will be taken away. The nature of Lucifer, Satan, will be taken away. And it is that that will get us, there will be an express way to heaven. Everything will clear before you. When there's sanctification, everything will clear before you. When there's holiness, an express way, without any accident, you'll not have accident on the way. And you will get to heaven in Jesus' name. Let's look at point number three briefly. The integrity of newly made men. The integrity of newly made men. And you come into the hands of the Lord and He recreates you. You come into the hands of the Lord and He refashions you. You come into the hands of the Lord. He sanctifies you. He circumcises you. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, and that He put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's false holiness there's pretended holiness, there's hypocritical holiness, there's superficial holiness. Say, no, 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 no. That one will not get to heaven. He says, He will recreate you in this true holiness. We're looking at uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm reading here from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds 
and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. When God circumcises your heart, he says he will write his, himself, himself, himself. He will write his law in your heart. He will write his word in your heart that you'll just know this is the will of God and you will love it. You'll delight in it because it is written inside your heart. Or looking at, um, at Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 and I'm reading from verse 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 and we're reading from verse 16. Here Paul the Apostle said, he says in verse 16, herein do I exercise myself. He says, I count this as normal exercise. I count this as regular exercise. I count this as compulsory exercise. I count this as a, a necessity. This is what I do. He says, to have always, always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. He says, I I'm afraid to offend God. I take care not to offend God. I put myself in a mode of action and in a mode of lifestyle. I will not offend God. It says, I exercise myself. I take diligent care that I will exercise myself not to have any offense toward God or toward any man. I pray this will be our attitude. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, I'm reading from verse twelve. Second Peter chapter one, and we're reading from verse twelve. It tells us in Second Peter chapter one, and it tells us in verse twelve here uh, what our attitude should be, and it tells us what our relationship should be. Everything it says, wherefore I will not be negligent. Wherefore I'll not be negligent. You see, there are people who are negligent about the circumcision, the circumcision of heart, the sanctification of their soul, sanctification of their spirit. And here Peter said, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. You'll be established. You will have this thing. You'll possess the sin. You will live by it. And it will be a real experience in your life in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3, chapter 3 of uh, Second Peter. And I'm reading here from verse 11. Seeing then uh, that all these sins shall be dissolved. What's, what's that about? It's saying all the elements of the world shall be dissolved. All the houses in the world shall be dissolved. It says all the physical things you see in the world, they shall be dissolved. And see that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons? What she to be in all holy conversation and godliness. When you are sanctified, holy conversation and godliness. When you are circumcised, holy, holy heart and holy conversation and godliness. Looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the enemy shall melt with poverty. Nevertheless, 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 we sit people, sanctified people, nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth wherein dwelleth righteousness holiness purity sanctification there'll be no unrighteousness there in that new heavens and the new earth there'll be no adamic nature there there'll be no nature of it there there'll be no excuse makers there there'll be no grumblers there there'll be no murmurers there it says in the new heaven wherein dwelleth righteousness whereof beloved seeing that she look for such things i'm looking for the coming of the lord I'm looking for the time of the rapture. I'm looking for that time when the dead in Christ shall rise and then we which are alive will be caught together. We'll be in church like this and then the rapture takes place and we're gone. We'll be in the car and then we're gone. We'll be in the office and then we're gone. We'll be in our houses and then we're gone. Is this that what we're looking for? We are for beloved sin that she look for such things. Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, tell me, without spot and blameless. If you are carrying Adamic nature about, if you are pregnant with Adamic nature, if you are expressive of Adamic nature, if the engine of Adamic nature is inside you, engineering, propelling, and moving you in everything you do, if self, if self will is there, if the nature of Satan is there, if all that is there on the inside, 
there's a blame, there's a blot, and there's a spot. And there is this that is going to keep you down here. That's why it says, Wherefore, beloved, see that she look for such things. Be diligent, be diligent, don't be lazy, be diligent, be active, don't be passive, be passionate about this. Be diligent that she may be found of fame in peace without spot and blameless. It can begin tonight. I said it can begin tonight. Where you are there, whether you're standing or leaning or whatever you're doing, you say, Lord, I come at this time. Circumcision is instantaneous. Sanctification is instantaneous. The purifying of the heart is instantaneous. Lord, you'll do it for me today. And when you do it, whatever God does, it will become permanent. I said to become permanent and then you go out from here that thing that is having a downward pull in your life in your heart and then you are struggling and dragging that thing will be burnt off from your life the fire of heaven will come upon the altar of your soul it will burn every chaff out of your life and then when it comes time to fly for the glory of God you'll be up there soaring above they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength you are going to wait upon the Lord tonight and renew your strength and it says they shall not be weary they shall not be tired you will run you will not faint and then it says you'll walk and you will not be weary anybody wanting to wait on the Lord and ask the Lord tonight I said anybody wanting to go to the Lord tonight and lay everything on the altar and say oh Lord here is my heart here is my life here is my past here is my present here is my future here is my talent here is everything I've got Oh Lord, I come. You will sanctify me today. You will circumcise me today. Every sin of the Adamic nature, every sin will be burnt off here today. Lord, I'm coming to you right now and I want my heart and I want my mind and I want my soul and I want my spirit. Everything to be laid upon the altar. The fire will burn. The fire will burn. It will burn every charm. It will burn every earthly thing. It will burn all the excuse making. It will burn all the covetousness. It will burn everything that is inside there, everything of the Adamic nature, everything will be burnt up today. Oh Lord, here am I, I come. Here am I, I come. Let the fire come from heaven and come upon the altar of my soul. This sin will be burnt up. This sin will be burnt up. This will be, I will be free tonight. I must be free tonight. I must be free tonight. Lord, come and do it. Lord, come and do it. Lord, come and do it. The Lord thy God will circumcise your heart and the heart of thy seed that you may love God with all your heart and with all your soul and that thou mayest live the time has come god wants to walk let him do it